So good afternoon, everybody. First of all, I want to thank Renzo for the very kind invitation. Also, congratulations for the organization of this wonderful conference. It's really great. And it's a pleasure to be uh, in Sicily for the first time. So uh, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, topology of nodal sets of uh, eigenfunctions of some quantum systems. I actually, I'm going to focus on a very specific, precise system, the harmonic oscillator. Uh, so during the, the talk, of course, you can interrupt me at any moment if you have questions, comments. So it's not it's not a problem at all. Okay. And let's see if I can keep the microphone near my mouth because I'm not a rock star, so it's uh, I'm not so used to to this. <laughs> okay, so I want to start this story with this beautiful, in my view, spectacular experiment by Mark, Mark Dennis, and um, and collaborators already more than ten years ago. He already introduced uh, this uh, during his talk. So it's um, it's slightly different uh, context. It's in optics. Uh, so equation PD here is a Hemholtz equation. He considered in the talk uh, uh, in, and in the paper a paraxial approximation. And uh, they constructed uh, in this uh, in the laboratory. Uh, they created uh, optical beams, very very focused uh, Gaussian beams. Uh, with knotted and linked lines of zero intensity, so nodal lines, uh, also known as, as optical vortices, and uh, in the shape of several knots or links. So, for example, here this is a numerical reconstruction from measured optical phase fields. So, I want to emphasize that they really appear in the experiment. It's not a, a numerical simulation, same as Irving and Kleckner uh, knots in fluids. They really appear in the experiment. And uh, so here, for example, we can see uh, Hoff link here, Trefoy knot. This one, I don't know. Maybe Mark, you remember which one is this? But <laughs> who? Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, so and of course they can produce other other knots. So this is uh, this is a motivation to consider this problem to try to understand uh, nodal lines of solutions to some equations, uh, Schrodinger operators. But um, so although I'll I'll say something about uh, about M, uh, about solutions to the Hemmholtz equation later. I'm going to focus uh, in this talk on some, on a quantum system, uh, which is uh, which is say a paradigmatic quantum system, which is the quantum harmonic oscillator. So let me uh, recall the what the quantum harmonic oscillator is, how it's described. Uh, so it's uh, is defined by this spectral problem in Euclidean space. I'm going to consider R3. And uh, the potential is the usual uh, distance uh, distance square potential, x square. And uh, we look for solutions to this eigenvalue problem. Lambda is a, is a real number, the eigenvalues of this operator here. Delta is the Laplacian, and uh, which are complex valued. So they, they have real and imaginary part. So of course, in some sense, we can say that we know everything about this spectral problem. In which sense? Uh, uh, well, we know, of course, eigenvalues. Uh, they have this form, 2m plus 3, and it's, it's the quantum number, and in non-negative integer. Also, we know the multiplicity. It grows like n squared. We also know explicit expressions of the eigenfunctions. It's the decay uh, as a Gaussian with the, uh, with the radius, with the distance to the origin. And also, I mean, I, I'll write the explicit expressions later. But um, saying that we understand everything about this system is the same as saying that we understand everything about polynomials. They are very explicit, the polynomials. But of course, uh, real, uh, real or complex algebraic geometry, it's a, a theory to try to understand zeros of polynomials. So in this, uh, in this sense, uh, OK, let's introduce the, the definition of nodal set, the, the usual definition of, of a function or, or eigenfunctions in this case. So it's simply the, the set of points in, in space uh, where the function vanishes, just that. So here, uh, since uh, I'm considering complex valued uh, functions, so you have a real and imaginary parts, complex valued. So nodal set is typically, so it's intersection of, uh, of the zero set of the real part, intersection of zero set, zero set of imaginary part, typically it's lines, okay, could be, Compact, but also non-compact. So you have curves. And 
in principle, of course, these curves can be noted, can be linked in many complicated ways in space. So we would like to understand uh, in which ways uh, nodal lines of eigenfunctions of this uh, quantum harmonic oscillator uh, may appear. So, for example, here uh, could be the trefoil node, or it could be if it has several components, could be Borromean rings or other much more complicated uh, nodes and links. Okay. So why the nodal sets? The nodal sets already appear, of course, uh, during the conference in many, many talks, starting from Renzo's talk, Mark, many others. So uh, in the physics literature, they have uh, several interpretations, several names. So of course, the most obvious is the locus of destructive interference of wave function is the zero, but also, um, it's uh, it, it, this name also appear. I think uh, already in Renzo's talk, uh, this the name of dislocation wave dislocation, just yes, set of singularities of phase function already in the bit talk in, in in many talks this appear, this is the same. Also, uh, you can understand uh, the set of zeros of a certain vector field. This is the the usual probability current vector field that is defined in quantum in quantum mechanics, uh, the gradient of the wave function times the complex conjugate of psi, take the imaginary part, this is a vector field. So uh, zero set, the nodal set of psi is also a zero set of this vector field. But also you can take the curl of this, the rotational of this vector field. This can be understood as a quantum vorticity field. And uh, nodal lines are also, are, are integral curves of this vector field. So they are also vortex lines. So they have several, several interpretations depending on, on the object that you want to study. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, of course, also from the mathematical viewpoint, it's uh, it's very relevant that um, because you could look at uh, at other level sets of the function. Of course, why the zero? OK, the, the, the most important aspect of the zero set is that this invariant under, under conformal changes. If you multiply your function by by some constant, then the zero set, any other level set changes, of course, but the zero set remains. So it's uh, in some sense it's special this this property, and it's related to this, uh, of course, this uh, singularities of phase function, etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so now uh, so I, I stated the the setting quantum harmonic oscillator. So I want to introduce this problem or question stated by Michael Berry, uh, 2001. So in in his paper, he asked about the following. So if you have uh, any link, any finite link in R3, the question is if there exists an eigenfunction of the of the quantum harmonic oscillator and a diffeomorphism of Euclidean space, diffeomorphism of R3 uh, onto R3, preserving orientation, such that the the image, the deformation of the link under the diff diffeomorphism is a union of components of the nodal set of the eigenfunction. I said union of components because typically it's very hard to get that the link is exactly the zero set of the eigenfunction. Typically, it's not. Um, so that's why it's union of components. And, and also, uh, it's the question if it's structurally stable. I mean, if it's robust, if it's stable under perturbations, at least small perturbations. This is the problem. Uh, of course, I, I recall here that something important, the link is union of pairwise smooth closed curves. Uh, I, I'm not fixing any orientation, uh, so it, it was important in some in some previous talks, the orientation of the link, also in the width, in your talk. Uh, before here, um, I don't mind about orientation, it's just uh, closed curves in a space, disjoint, pairwise disjoint. You could fix orientations, and you can and you can prove an analogous theorem to, to the one that I'm stating in the next slide. Uh, and you could even fix uh, the, the framing, the trivialization provided by the real part of the gradient. Um, it could be the ciphered framing, but not necessarily any other uh, framing. But uh, but here I'm just uh, thinking of, uh, of of the link without any framing, without any orientation, just a curve, curve in a space, closed curve. So, um, and by structural stability, uh, I precisely mean that um, the, the obvious notion, I mean, if you perturb the function, then the new function has still a zero set that is close to the original one. So precisely, this is that if you take any other function, complex valued phi, such that it's C1 close to the original psi, to your original eigenfunction, epsilon is small enough, 
then this uh, this phi has uh, has a nodal set which is small deformation of the original nodal set of the nodal set of psi. Here you need, of course, C1 because you need to control gradients of functions. OK, so important remark here is that uh, in, in this paper, uh, Barry, he, he gave a recipe, the examples, not general theory, uh, examples where maybe trefoil knot and half link to construct eigenfunctions, not of the harmonic oscillator, but of the hydrogen atom uh, with nodal sets that contain uh, any torus link. Any torus link, any torus knot in general. <laughs> Actually, this method was first developed also in a very of, in a paper of very and Mark, and for not not for the not for the quantum harmonic or, or hydrogen atom, but for monochromatic waves, so solutions to the Helmholtz, Helmholtz equation, and uh, they developed this very nice recipe. It was later also um, developed and studied by by Benjamin in his thesis. So it's a, it's a very beautiful construction. You can ask them about this. So it's uh, you start with a, with a solution which has a, a circular nodal line, but it's very degenerate. So the gradient vanishes there. It's a degenerate zero set. And you perturb this so that uh, there is a bifurcation of, uh, of, of, of a different nodal line with topology. So it's based on the principle that any node or link can be uh, can be described as a braided, as a braid, as a closed braid, and and this is this is used in the in the construction. So the original uh, method was developed by Barry and Dennis in this paper for torus knots and links. Okay, so this is the problem, and uh, so I'm going to state the theorem that we proved uh, in this setting. So um, so indeed, uh, so Barry in his work, uh, one of the considerations and suggestions is that. Uh, we have very high multiplicity of the eigenvalues of the of the harmonic oscillator of also of the hydrogen atom. So remember, I told you about uh, eigenvalues and multiplicity. So eigenvalues is n multiplicity grows with n square. So it tends to infinity when the quantum number tends to infinity. So it stands to reason that um, when when n is very large, you have uh, uh, the the space the dimension of the space of eigenfunction is very large. It tends to infinity, so it's reasonable that you have many, many uh, functions there, so that you can realize uh, any knot or any link in the in the zero set inside the zero set of such uh, of, of a function inside such a vector space of very high dimension. So the theorem that we that we prove with uh, with my colleague Alberto Enciso and and David Harley, former former postdoc at the ICMAT from Australia, is the following. So uh, take any any link, any finite link that you want, smooth. Then there exists uh, a diffeomorphism of Euclidean space such that uh, the transform link, phi of L, is a union of structurally stable components of the zero set of, of psi, where psi is an eigenfunction of the harmonic oscillator. So in other words, there exists for any link, for any link, there exists an eigenfunction of the harmonic oscillator, which realizes inside the, the zero set such a link up to diffeomorphism, of course, up to deformation. So uh, some remarks here are important. So the first one is that um, the eigenfunction realizing uh, the link is not unique. Actually, there are infinitely many. Is that the theorem actually is that for any large enough eigenvalue, there exists an eigenfunction with the desired property. Uh, so this meaning given L, there exists a lambda knot, some, some high number, some large number, such that for any eigenvalue lambda bigger than lambda knot, you have precisely an eigenfunction there with such a with such a link component. Okay, and actually it's a structurally, a structurally stable. This means that it's not isolated. You can perturb slightly inside the space of eigenfunctions and is still there the the component, okay. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I want to emphasize here and insist uh, on the fact that it's um, union of components. So this means that the zero set, if you look at the zero set of your eigenfunction, uh, it has other components. Actually, in general, many other components. So your link is there, your knot is there, but there are other other structures. And it's a it's a challenging very very challenging open problem to know if there exists an eigenfunction realizing exactly 
such a, a link, a given link. Probably, I mean, it's very hard. I, I would say that in general, not, or, or that the typical situation is that there are many components. I, I'll show you a picture, uh, the next slide, or in a couple of slides. And uh, another remark is okay. So I talk about the diffeomorphism. This diffeomorphism is not close to the identity, the 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 knot. Or the or link realized by the by the again function psi is not close to the original one. It's diffeomorphic, but not close. So actually, the effect of the diffeomorphism is that you have to shrink L into a into a ball of radius lambda to power minus one half. So since lambda is usually very large, this means that your knot or link is inside a very very extremely very small ball usually. So and actually this um, this lambda is well this, this size this lambda minus one half is is, is very natural is the natural length scale for high energy eigenfunctions. So simply uh, remember that lambda is the size let's say of the Laplacian of the second derivative. So first the de derivative has size square root of lambda. So the the, the typical variation in a space is uh, is the inverse of a square root of, of lambda. It's, it's the same that happens for the sine sine of a square root of lambda x, you have many, many zeros, right, in, at this scale. So this is the, the natural uh, length scale of variation for high energy eigenfunctions. So, um, okay, so the, an important question, I, I'm not going to mention much about, uh, much about this because it is very hard, um, is the following. So, um, so you could ask uh, how generic uh, or typical these structures Ah, so I said it's structurally stable. There exists such an eigenfunction. If you perturb it, it's likely still there. But maybe the probability of finding these structures uh, is very low. Okay, so at the first glance, um, so th there is a theory developed, uh, a beautiful, uh, fantastic theory developed by, by Fedor Nazarov and Misha Sodin uh, not long ago, maybe 10 years ago, uh, to, to understand, to study a nodal set, zero set, of monochromatic waves, of random Gaussian random monochromatic waves. So this is the, the, the Gaussianity or the probability is introduced in the coefficients of a certain series. So, so you describe your monochromatic wave as a linear superposition of some elements in a basis, fixed elements, very uh, explicit functions. And then each coefficient, each coefficient is a random variable. It's a Gaussian random variable. That's how probability enters into the picture. You, you could define something analogous here. You have a linear combination of the elements of the basis of your eigenfunctions space, and each uh, coefficient is Gaussian. You can consider it to be Gaussian. So a heuristic uh, or a direct application, I'd say naive uh, application of this theory, would suggest that a typical Gaussian random eigenfunction should exhibit these components, these small components growing as lambda to power three over two, when lambda tends to infinity. So I said heuristic and I said naive because probably this is false. And this is where, again, Mark comes into the picture, Mark and, and Sandy. Um, I'm sorry, Mark already showed this picture in his talk. So, um, so they did, they did a lot of numerical simulations, uh, Sandy Taylor and Mark. Uh, they saw uh, indeed that the number of components grow. I mean, there are many, many nodal components, but they, he already mentioned this. Uh, these components typically are not small; they are large. For example, this is this is one of these components, extremely large component in the in the nodal set. And actually, they uh, it was hard for them to find these small components. Um, so this means that that probably um, this Nazarov and Sodin theory doesn't apply to in in this context. There is indeed one reason why you, you cannot directly apply it because, uh, uh, and which is that uh, it's not translational invariant, the system, you have the zero, the, the minimum of the of the harmonic oscillator, that's an important point, that's a special point. You, you don't have this translational invariance. This prevents you from applying directly directly the theory, the theory but still uh, this, this, this growth, lambda to three over two, so why, why lambda three over two? So heuristically is because, um, so we said that uh, the the nodes, the nodal lines, are in this in this size, lambda minus one over two. 
So how many of these balls uh, you need to cover a ball of, of radius one, let's say. So since you have volume, uh, which is uh, number three, you have that you need this uh, lambda to, uh, to power three over two balls to cover a unit ball with these small balls. So this actually turns out to be true that uh, nodal lines grow like this for other systems. So for example, for the nodal lines of the eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on the torus or on the sphere, on the round sphere, on the flat torus. There you can apply Nazarov and Sodin theory, and then you get this number, this growth. Here you can't, so probably it's not true, and actually Mark and Sandy suggested that it's not true, but still it's, it's open to understand. I don't know, Mark, if, uh, if you measure somehow how the number of components grows with eigenvalue, uh, if it's uh, some power in, or not really, you didn't look at, at this. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's still a very interesting problem, yeah. Okay, so um, so let me tell you a bit about uh, about the proof of uh, of the theorem. Um, so okay, th there's a first observation, which is that uh, it is the following very simple observation. So let's rescale space variables. So x is the the original variable. So let's introduce x tilde uh, as a square root of lambda times x. So this means that uh, if x tilde has value one you are considering x of size one over square root of lambda. This is the natural length scale for eigenfunctions of, uh, of a Schrodinger operator. So uh, in this case, with this after this change, uh, you have that the equation takes this form. So this is the Laplacian in the new coordinates. You, you define phi as the rescale uh, eigenfunction. So I evaluated at this um, uh, this variable, and here you see that there is uh, x tilde squared divided by lambda squared. So, so what this means is that um, if you keep, if you take, if, if you look uh, x tilde just on a ball of radius one, say, of order one x tilde, which means a ball of radius one over square root of lambda for x for the original space variables. This means that when lambda tends to infinity, this term becomes very small. This is of order one, this part here, this is very large, so it's negligible. You can forget about this. So in some sense, what you get is the Helmholtz equation. So it's Laplacian of phi plus phi equals zero. So in the limit, what this means is that um, in balls, in a ball of, in the unit ball for the variables x tilde, when lambda is very large, the eigenfunctions uh, of this operator, of many other, this this works also for uh, eigenfunctions of the Laplacian on any Riemannian manifold. Actually, they behave in, in in balls in the original variables in balls of radius one over square root of lambda as solutions to the Helmholtz equation. Okay, in the unit ball in this variable. So this is one implication. I mean, uh, and it's it's rather general for any um, eigenvalue problem that is reasonably will behaved. So that uh, locally. Uh, the local at, at this uh, natural length scale, you can understand uh, the eigenfunctions of the of the operator uh, as approximate solutions to the to the uh, Helmholtz equation. The the key point here is uh, the converse, the converse claim, which then turns out to be not true for in general. So this is um, this is what we call inverse localization lemma. In this case, for the harmonic oscillator. I'll tell you later for which other systems such a lemma holds, and it's the, the following. So let's consider any solution to the Hamel's equation in R3. Okay, not any, even or odd. You need some parity because actually eigenfunctions of uh, of uh, harmonic oscillator they have some definite parity depending on the quantum number. Okay, <laughs> so let's take any even or odd solution to this Hamel's equation in R3. Fix any error, any epsilon and any integer, this will be the number of derivatives that you control, uh, then for any large enough eigenvalue lambda of the harmonic oscillator, there exists an eigenfunction psi such that when you look at the eigenfunction at the natural variation scale for the eigenvalue problem, so this means uh, uh, the, the variables divided by a square root of lambda, 
and you compared you compare with phi with your uh, with the solution to the MOS equation, they are very close. They are as close as you want. So um, what this means is that uh, sorry, is that you are uh, you are somehow transplanting the MOS solution into an, a high energy eigenfunction of the harmonic oscillator at, in a very, very small scale. So the original solution of the MOS equation lives, okay, it lives in R3, but actually here you are looking all, only uh, at points inside the unit ball, say, or some finite size ball. And then uh, there exists an eigenfunction of the harmonic oscillator, which is very close to this given solution to the MOS equation. So it's some, something somehow insert it in the in the solution okay. at this small scale no, not outside outside this small ball of radius one over square root of lambda you don't know what happens with the with the again function of the of the harmonic oscillator but inside the ball you control everything is essentially the pi the, the solution you started with anyone mm -hmm. okay so so how is this uh, inverse localization lemma proved so um okay so let's introduce uh spherical coordinates um so we start so in the in the lemma we start with a solution to the m molds equation uh, laplacian phi plus phi equals zero so first uh, result a first observation is that um, any solution to the m molds equation can be approximated in in a compact set or say in the unit ball by uh, a series, a finite series of this form, a Fourier Bessel series. So, some coefficients and uh, complex values, in this case, coefficients. Here, JL are the spherical uh, Bessel functions, and here they are spherical harmonics. So, you can think uh, that your phi, that your solution to, to Elmo's equation, is this series. It's a given series, okay? Finite, finite series. You, you, you sum till L0, no more. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. And since uh, we assume that phi is even, okay, the same for odd in the odd case, uh, you have that here you have sums, sum all, only over uh, even uh, L numbers. So this means that you can take CLM to be zero for odd L. Mm -hmm. So, but then on the other hand, I told you that I, I would write the, the expression for the harmonic oscillator eigenfunction. So you can take an orthogonal basis of harmonic oscillator eigenfunctions, uh, which is one. This is in, in any textbook on quantum mechanics. So it's uh, the case exponentially. These are Laguerre polynomials. These are, again, um, uh, spherical harmonics. And in this case, uh, using these quantum numbers, KLM, you have the eigenvalues of this expression. So you have this extra de degeneracy. Uh, because this this come this is uh, what I call before n, uh, so this is a single quantum number two k plus l. Okay, so but this uh, using k l and m, uh, these are the eigenvalues of the quantum harmonic oscillator. So uh, so the point is that we have the following asymptotic expansion for the uh, for the eigenvalues for the eigenfunctions sorry of the harmonic oscillator. So uh, we prove that. Um, as k tends to infinity, this means as the eigenvalue tends to infinity is very large. Uh, as, as far as you are in a compact set, let's say r smaller or equal than one, then your uh, your eigenfunction, the eigenfunctions uh, behave the, the the basis, the elements of the basis of the eigenfunction psi k l m, they have this expression, very very explicit expression. So some constant a, that depends on k and l, a k l. And then something that is a small with k, and here something very very explicit, just the, the spherical Bessel functions evaluated uh, not on r but on square root of lambda times r. Okay, you have this expansion, and here times the angular part, which uh, which are the spherical harmonics, and then and the same sort of asymptotic series uh, holds for the gradient. Just uh, actually, if you take derivatives here, uh, formal is is the same. You you get this. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so you have this lemma, and uh, well, this constant it has um, it, it has an explicit expression actually, but we only need the asymptotics when k is large. The constant be behaves like like this: is k to this power l plus one over two plus some small term, smaller term. 
So, um, so with this arm, with this uh, asymptotic expansion, we can prove the, the inverse localization lemma. So it's natural now. It's very natural uh, to guess why it is true because if you look, okay, let let's just remember that uh, in this asymptotic expansion, what we are saying is that these uh, eigenfunctions of the harmonic oscillator, the basis, they are essentially uh, the Bessel functions, tiny spherical harmonics, essentially that Bessel functions, tiny spherical harmonics. But now remember uh, how I wrote the solution to the m molds equation. I wrote it as combination of Bessel functions times spherical harmonics. Here there is an R, but here there is a lambda times R. So that's why probably one needs to divide here by square root of lambda to get rid of this and to get the just spherical Bessel function here. Okay, so you can do this. Uh, you can write the computations and uh, you can prove the dilemma. So, um, okay, let's give a, a bit more of detail. So we fix a large constant k hat, much bigger than this L0 over 2. L0 was fixed from the beginning, is this constant given in the expansion of your Elmo solution. So you take any k, very large, and you define for any L smaller than L0 the following number, quantum number. K, the k hat that depends on L is the k hat that is fixed minus L over 2. So in principle, this is only an integer if L is even. So this is where evenness of the function will play a role. So now you are seeing. So with this choice, um, so why did I define this uh, quantum number k this way? Because with this choice, if you compute the eigenvalue lambda kl, which was this, uh, lambda kl, it has the expression 2k plus l, okay? If you plug here this k that depends also on l, this kl, you get an eigenvalue that is fixed, or uh, hat k plus three. It's fixed. It doesn't depend on L. You change L, KL, KL changes, but the total sum, the total eigenvalue is, is fixed. So this means that you do remain in the same uh, eigenfunction space. This is not changing. That's important, of course, because if not, you would have a superposition of uh, eigenfunctions with different eigenvalues. So with this, um, you construct an eigenfunction of the harmonic oscillator this way. It's uh, so you, you take the basis of your eigenfunctions of the harmonic oscillator, and the quantum numbers are L, M, and this KL that I defined before. Remember that with this choice, the eigenvalue is fixed, is this one. Okay. Here you take this constant CLM that appeared in the in the definition, say, or in the expression of the initial Helmholtz solution, this C, these constants are there, are, are fixed from the beginning. And you divide by this, uh, by these constants AKL that appear in the asymptotic expansion of your eigenfunctions of the harmonic oscillator. Okay, so with all of this, uh, first notice what I said, K is an integer because in the sum, in this sum, you can take L uh, even, only even, because for the L odd, we said that since our initial Helmholtz solution is an even function for L odd, this is zero, this CLM is zero. So for numbers for which this is not an integer, this is not contributing to the sum, it's not important. So you can take uh, really that L is even, and for L even, KL is, uh, is, uh, is an integer, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, with this, you already have uh, a solution to the um, an eigenfunction of the harmonic oscillator for this eigenvalue. And now you only have to use uh, the asymptotic expansion of the eigenfunctions to compare this comparison that I said that appears in the statement to compare to the eigenfunction, this eigenfunction evaluated uh, at points, um, at variables x over a square root of lambda, and uh, to compare that with uh, the Helmholtz equation on the variable x, okay? So if you do the, the estimate, you get the sum that you started with. You, you, you get the, you have here the constants that are fixed from the beginning, and you get here something that is of order one over k hat of L, which is uh, majorized by k hat minus L not over two. This C may be a very very large constant. Doesn't matter. Depends on the initial M mod solution you started with, but here you are dividing by this other constant. And remember that I said that we, we, we shall take this k hat, 
we are free to take any k hat that we want. We shall take this k hat to be very, very large, much, much larger than L naught over two. So with this taken large enough, you can take this quotient to be smaller than the epsilon that you fixed from the beginning. And then this, this proves the, the localization lemma. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. So this is the um, this is the strategy. And actually, if you want to prove a, an inverse localization lemma for other Schrodinger operators, you, you follow the same the same uh, technique. But uh, okay, I, I tell you that unfortunately there are very few operators for which we can prove the this result for for a very good reason. Mm -hmm. Okay, so so what's the the conclusion of this? So uh, so at this moment I, I didn't prove yet uh, that any node can be in the nodal set of the eigenfunction, et cetera. I just prove an inverse localization lemma. So what this means is that, what we prove is that um, something, a tool, a tool, uh, intermediate tool, uh, which is the inverse localization lemma that allows us, as I said before, to transplant solutions of the Helmholtz equation into high energy eigenfunctions of the harmonic oscillator. So with this, you can reduce the problem to analyze nodal sets of solutions to the Helmholtz equation. So then if you are able to produce a solution of the Helmholtz equation with a certain nodal topology, at least for some subset of nodal lines, then using this tool, using the inverse localization lemma, you insert this solution, part of the solution, just the solution on, on some ball, you insert the solution inside the solution inside the high energy eigenfunction of the harmonic oscillator. So your knot will be there, but you pay the price of the inverse localization lemma. The inverse localization lemma tells you that the insertion operates at this uh, scale of variation of the eigenfunction. It operates at the scale one over a square root of lambda. So this will mean that the insertion is in a very small ball. So then your knot will be very small, will be of this size, size of order one of the square root of lambda. Okay, and this comes from the inverse localization. So, um, so we have reduced the problem to the Elmo's equation. So then the, oops, sorry. So let's try to understand now then, uh, the natural point now is to understand nodal lines of uh, solutions to the Elmo's equation. Okay. So, uh, so, so for this, we prove uh, this result. Uh, uh, with Alberto also, and, and it's the following. So for any, so the theorem is that for any link in, in R3, a finite link, uh, there exists a diffeomorphism of um, Euclidean space that this time it's close to the identity as much as, as you want in any number of derivatives it's in CM norm, and you can fix a priori the M that you want. And uh, an uneven complex valued solution to the MOS equation in R3 such that the deform link phi tilde applied to, to L is union of a structurally stable components of the nodal set of such a Helmholtz solution phi. So this is saying that uh, it's, a, it's a similar statement to the theorem for the, uh, for the harmonic oscillator, but main difference is that here, the diffeomorphism, the, the deformation, you can take it to be as close to the identity as you want. So this means that um, given any link in, uh, in, in R3, you can deform it slightly, as, as small as you want the deformation, and then there will exist a solution to the Helmholtz equation such that uh, this solution has a, a zero set that contains this link. This link. As I said, the solution, the, the zero set of the solution, the nodal set will contain typically other components. And now here, actually, you can apply uh, Nazarov and sodium theory because these are monochromatic waves. In this setting, uh, we can actually say that with probability one, uh, a, a solution, a Gaussian random eigenfine, a Gaussian random monochromatic wave has infinitely many connected components. This is true uh, because Nazarov sorin applies in this case. Okay, but um, but at least there is a, a subset of the components which is this link. It's a given link. Okay, so um, so how is this proof? This is to, to prove this result. This is based on flexibility of, on, of the Helmholtz equation, of solutions to the Helmholtz equation. And the flexibility is expressed in the fact, very unusual fact, 
fact for a PDE that any local solution can be somehow extended to become global solution. Okay, this is from the differential geometry, differential topology, even dynamical systems viewpoint. This is this is uh, standard in life. I mean, you can always extend things. You have a, you have a function and you can extend it. You have a, uh, you you have something uh, a vector field defined on a, a tangent to a knot, for example. You can always extend the vector field, of course. But here there is the constraint. The constraint is the PDE. Uh, what you have is a solution to the PDE in some subset of a space, typically in a neighborhood of a knot, for example. Is it true that there exists a global solution to the PDE, Helmholtz equation in this case, that this uh, an extension uh, maybe up to an error of this local solution? In general, this is not true, but um, but it is true for solutions of the Helmholtz equation. So this is the the key the key theorem to prove this other theorem on the nodal lines of El, 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 Helmholtz solutions. It's this one: is that um, if you have any function any solution, any monochromatic wave that is defined uh, on a compact set, in a neighborhood of a compact set, then you assume some um, necessary topological condition, which is that the complement is connected. So for example, if you are in R2, in R you can think of R2, and you could take an annulus, right, in R2. Uh, for an annulus, this is not true. Why? Because the complement of the annulus in R2 is disconnected, right? You have two components, one the unbounded, one and one is the, the disk that is bounded. And then the problem when you uh, when you do the extension is that singularities will appear in the compact component. For the non-compact component, you can get rid of singularities because you push them to infinity. That's something that is used in uh, in some proofs of Gromov's edge principle in some other context. Uh, but here you have the, the PDE, and uh, what we prove is, is that there exists uh, a function that satisfies uh, globally, they satisfy uh, the solution, the, the equation, so they are global monochromatic waves in R3, and it's as close as you want to the local solution, to the solution phi tilde in this set K, or any number of derivatives that you want and any error that you fix a priori. And actually, this global solution, uh, it falls in the best way that it can for a monochromatic wave, uh, which is that it falls like one over the distance. But this is the better for a monochromatic wave. You cannot have monochromatic waves with finite energy, unfortunately. So, uh, so we have this global approximation result. So using this global approximation, uh, we can prove uh, this theorem, this theorem on the nodal set. So the strategy here is that, um, is that first you construct a local solution, a, a, a solution to the Helmholtz equation, phi tilde, in a neighborhood of the link, so you, you have the link, take a tubular neighborhood of it, and you construct, and then first you construct a local solution such that, uh, not defined everywhere, just in a neighborhood of the link, such that its zero set is exactly L. This time, no other components, exactly the zero set is L. But the solution phi tilde is not defined everywhere, it's defined just in a neighborhood of the link. Okay, and it's a structurally stable. This means actually that in the construction, the link is given by the intersection, transverse intersection of real, of, of zero set of real part and zero set of imaginary part, transverse intersection. So that's why it's a structurally stable. It follows from this rank condition, the gradient of phi tilde one and the gradient of phi tilde two, this matrix, a three times two matrix, uh, for any point of the link, it has maximal rank, it has rank two, okay? So using, using this, uh, this, uh, so you assume this local solution exists, then you use the global approximation theorem and you globalize the solution. So that's how you prove the, the theorem. So to construct this local solution, you use uh, Koshiko-Valeskaya theorem. Um, okay, I, I'll not talk about this, but uh, I, I want to insist that in this construction, you can fix many things. So you can fix, um, in the construction, you can fix the orientation, the orientation given by the by the cross product of gradient of phi one and phi two, you, you orient naturally. Uh, you orient naturally the link, of course, using the, the trivialization given by by these two functions. So you can prescribe it the orientation, and you can also prescribe that the the framing, the local framing defined by the gradient of the of this function, for example, on the link. So it could be a ciphered framing. So. Uh, 
uh, yeah, so so uh, so unlinked with the with the with the node, but it could be any other frame. It could be could wind uh, with the with the original node. This is not a problem because uh, for this, what you what you do is to apply Koshikovalskaya theorems to to some ribbons. So you take a, a ribbon uh, natural for the side third framing, but you can take any of the ribbon that is rotating. So no problem. It's a surface. Uh, as far as is uh, orientable and as far as is analytic, it can all be can always be, be made analytic. Then uh, you can prescribe many things in this local construction. Okay. Mm -hmm. So with this, um, you get the result. So finally, uh, putting together all these uh, all these uh, results. So I, I remember now. Uh, so it's, it was important the the result for the Helmholtz solutions to the for the nodal sets of Helmholtz solutions. And it's important also the inverse localization lemma. So putting together everything, uh, we, we have the proof for the harmonic oscillator. So first, we construct an even solution to the Helmholtz equation in R3 with a, with a zero set, with a nodal set that has a union, uh, with, that has a subset, uh, which is uh, a given, uh, given link, okay, a subset of the nodal set. And it's structurally stable, so it doesn't disappear after perturbation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then, second, you have constructed already the solution to the Helmholtz equation. This lives everywhere in R3. Okay. We don't want solutions to the Helmholtz equation. We want solutions to the quantum harmonic oscillator. Now we use the inverse localization lemma. The inverse localization lemma says that take this solution to the Helmholtz equation, not everywhere, just on the unit ball, say, or ball, large enough ball. And then let's shrink a lot this uh, this ball. It will be very tiny. Probably you don't observe this in numerical experiments. But then what you can do is to uh, insert now this tiny ball as a solution to the quantum harmonic oscillator for a very large eigenvalue. So it will be certainly, uh, as you will get certainly a solution no longer for the Helmholtz equation, but for the quantum harmonic oscillator, but paying the price of the smallness of the of the link. And of course, the price of that there will be typically many, many other components. And as Sandy and Dennis, uh, Mark Dennis suggested, probably most of them are very large components. Okay, so this was um, the proof. Just to finish, a couple of slides. Just the first one, it's, uh, I wanted to mention the, the hydrogen atom, the quantum hydrogen atom, because this was actually the, the original computations of Barry in his paper. So, uh, so the problem is also well known. The the formulation. So it's here you have uh, the the inverse one over x uh, typical uh, potential for the for the hydrogen atom for the Kepler problem, and uh, the eigenvalues are well known minus one over n square. There is the difference that uh, now uh, the spectrum uh, it has discrete spectrum which is the negative, which is given by these eigenvalues. It, it has. Uh, has continuous spectrum, which is the positive part. I, I'm not looking at that part. So now the, the discrete spectrum does no longer accumulate at infinity, as happened for the quantum harmonic oscillator. It accumulates at zero. Uh, when n is very large, this lambda tends to zero. Okay. So again, uh, you have eigenfunctions that are explicit, explicitly written in terms of special functions, etc. So we prove uh, also an analogous theorem. So given it's, it's essentially the same uh, the same theorem as the theorem for the harmonic oscillator, better now in the sense that, um, so given any link, if you take lambda, okay, I cannot say now very large because I should say now lambda close enough to zero, highly excited state, close enough to zero, then there exists a complex valued eigenfunction uh, with this eigenvalue lambda and a diffeomorphism such that uh, the deformation of the link is union of components of the nodal set. And now this diffeomorphism is no longer uh, shrinking. I mean, this diffeomorphism, you can take it to be close to the identity. Now this is the, the advantage with respect to the, to the harmonic uh, oscillator. It's, if you start with a, with a link, you only need to deform it slightly to realize it in the in the nodal component of the of the hydrogen atom. Okay, and just uh, and just final remarks. Some other um, some other uh, 
operators where inverse localization lemma can be proved for high energy eigenfunctions. So um, we can prove, uh, so, okay, uh, unfortunately, the mm, a main disadvantage, there are two disadvantages of this to prove this, uh, of our proof, doesn't mean that the lemma is false for more general uh, operators, but for of our proof is that we need high multiplicity, very high, I mean, multiplicity tending to infinity, tending to infinity when the eigenvalue grows, we need this. And uh, we need uh, somehow explicit expressions of the eigenfunctions to do, uh, to compute asymptotics uh, in terms of Bessel functions, whatever. So uh, with these two constraints, very, very strong constraints, we cannot go very far proving the inverse localization property for other quantum systems. So for example, we can prove it for Laplace eigenfunctions of the cube in Rn with Dirichlet boundary conditions. There it's true, the inverse localization. You can transplant always uh, Helmholtz solutions. You can prove it for Laplace eigenfunctions on the sphere and on the torus, dimension, any dimension bigger or equal than two. Okay, uh, and uh, you can prove also for products, for Laplace eigenfunctions of products of tori and of spheres. Still, you have some symmetry somewhere there, so this means that the multiplicity grows. And um, actually, we can prove that we can characterize flat tori here with lattices uh, for which uh, inverse localization holds or not. And you can also uh, study again functions of quantum harmonic oscillator on hyperbolic space, a negative, a constant negative curvature. Okay, so I stop here. So thank you for your attention.